I'd like for us to start right at the beginning, Esther. Uh, what was the atmosphere like in higher education in the 1930s, just before the emergence of the ACE concern over student personnel programs? Denny, as you don't know, because you weren't born then, probably, um, a lot of men had come back from wor World War I, and they had government money to go back to college. Mm -hmm. And the colleges were just overwhelmed with these men's students. And most of the universities that I knew anything about at that time had put in administration teams at the top of their programs to just provide for beds and housing mm -hmm. and new buildings that had to be, temporary buildings that had to be put up for these men. And it was a struggle to keep from having chaos on the campuses. And um, there wasn't much time and, and enough staff to pay attention to these young men. And um, as human beings, they had faculty, they organized the classes, and they tried to keep the buildings hygienic anyway. But um, some of the human qualities that you and I believe in that are important for education were a little thin. They were kind of lacking. And um, some of the leaders then at that point started to recognize the lack right. of attention to these human qualities. And I was fortunate because Walter Dill Scott had headed up the, all the psychologists in the country during World War I. Mm -hmm. And these famous psychologists, maybe they were famous then, but they got more famous as a result of creating tests for these young men who swarmed into the army, practiced with, with broom, you know, instead of guns, brooms, and um, they needed to be sorted out who would do what in this army that they were developing. And um, so they, the psychologists gave them these tests and figured out who could do what in the army to make it an efficient army and also make use of the best talents of the young men. So the testing was directed towards efficiency of placement, literally. Exactly, okay. to begin with. And um, Walter Dill Scott was the head of that whole thing. So when he get, when the army, when they could come back, the war was over, um, he set up a business hmm. in Pittsburgh and hired some of these same men with whom he'd been working. They were probably partners. And um, he started doing this kind of thing not so much for colleges, more for businesses mm -hmm. to begin with. And then he was um, persuaded to come to Northwestern as president. And he said to himself and to the others, why not do the same thing in a university? And um, so he brought L.B. Hopkins in and Dr. Hopkins started work with the men. Mm -hmm. Nobody was doing anything for the women. and. Um, so that was when he heard about what I was, Mortarboard was doing, and Mr. Hopkins gave him a copy of my report. And so he really changed my life around hmm. and uh, okay. said that he could get, he was pretty sure he could get a full-time scholarship for me. And I was engaged, and this didn't appeal to my fiancé. Uh, he thought we were going to be married and live a very conventional life, such as he had known <laughs> when he grew up. And this kind of shook that up a little bit. And, but he finally agreed that it was probably the, the ultimate values would be greater. So I went to Northwest to uh, Teachers College, where I, got, I had a wonderful experience that year and um, met a lot of very interesting men. I imagine he'd written to them, mm -hmm. told them I was coming and to be nice to me. And I met Herbert Hawks there that first year. And he was not only the dean of Columbia College of the university, but he also was chairman of a new committee that they had at the American Council. Mm -hmm. This committee was the Student Personnel Work Committee. and. Um, and so that was already in the formation stages, that committee, when yes. you came to Teachers College. Although, in getting ready for this, I did some historical research myself. And American Council on Education was started in 1918, mm -hmm. partly as a result of the upset of this war and what it had done to society. 
And very soon it became the most prestigious educational group in the country. Mm -hmm. it's, it was in Washington. And um, I arrived in New York in 1923 in the fall. The American Council on Education, I've discovered, had as its first committee, very first committee, a committee on anthropology. So which, that was the, the, the original name of the That was the original activity. The, <laughs> no, it wasn't the original name. Oh, okay. But then that committee, which had come from the National Research Council over to the American Council on Education. But okay. I think it's very significant that their first committee was one on anthropology, mm -hmm. not psychology. But the anthropology committee, in looking at the needs of the culture which existed in colleges and universities, recommended to the association, ACE, American College, so, uh, American, no, American Council, Council on Education, on Education mm -hmm. that um, they set up a committee to counsel college students, especially these young men coming back in their educational careers and their vocational mm -hmm. careers. So that committee got started, and you know that was just before ACE got started. Mm -hmm. And that was happening about the time I landed for my master's degree. Mm -hmm. And I got to know Dean Hawks, Herbert Hawks, who was chairman of that committee. <clears throat> well, I went back to Northwestern for two years. And then by circumstances that were interesting, uh, both my husband and I needed or had invitations. I had an invitation. And he thought he must develop a, an office in New York. Mm -hmm. So we came back to New York. I finished my degree, my doctorate, and Herbert Hawks, who became a very good friend, married a very good friend, mm -hmm. who had been the, she'd taken her doctor's degree in the department that was just getting started, mm -hmm. into which I went as a lecturer first and then professor. And um, the two of them were very good friends, and Herbert Hawks wanted me on his committee. And first of all, he knew I'd helped L.B. Hopkins do that study in the report. And so then he recommended, or the committee recommended, that I do a study, preliminary study for them of what it was in colleges and universities that had the most personal effect on mm -hmm. students. Well, I had the most fascinating time. I interviewed every fourth or fifth senior. And um, we had wonderful interviews. And they really opened their hearts and their mouths to me. We, talked at least an hour, and sometimes they stayed longer. You well, did all the interviews yourself, personally? Yeah. yeah. And um, then at the committee meeting in Washington of the ACE, at which I reported this, it was approved, and they were going to sponsor a larger study because they thought it was interesting. And just in that meeting, one of the geniuses of this century, Ben Wood, who had been, he was one of the ones who was in this little group, Dean Hawks, and he were very good buddies. He was director of research in Columbia College. And um, he presented a plan for a, a very ambitious testing, national testing program for children in elementary, secondary schools, and colleges. And the Rockefeller Foundation had already given him a, quite a grant. And he proposed this, and the whole committee was flabbergasted. It was magnificent. I was I, very much impressed with it, too. And with apologies to me for presenting this just after I'd presented my study, mm -hmm. and we all just fell for this idea, which you know has turned into the American testing, Educational, educational testing, testing, testing Service in Princeton. It made so much money after a little while selling all of these tests to all co so many colleges and universities and elementary schools, the whole works, that it has a whole string of beautiful buildings in mm -hmm. just outside of Princeton. And it has a $2 million building dedicated to Ben Wood, who mm -hmm. really started the whole thing. Well, and this was approximately at the same time at that the, the, same, the time. same ACE exactly. committee was considering the student personnel And issues. so we split. And Herbert <laughs> Hawks be, went over to be chairman of the testing committee of the American Council on Education. 
And Ed Williamson came in as a member of, and we enlarged that committee too. Some of the people went on to the testing committee, and some stayed with this broader committee. And uh, Ed Williamson became the chairman. And there were, I suppose, about 10 or 12 members of this broader committee. And very soon, we saw the need of writing some brochures about the student personnel work on college campuses. And I had written a book, actually is my doctoral dissertation, which Harper and Brothers was, got interested in. They'd heard about it. And one of the editors was very much interested in this new developing concern for the personal lives and developments and the social <laughs> atmosphere of colleges and universities. And he wanted to publish my book. So that was the first book that came out in the field. And this was what year? This was 1929. It was okay. published. Mm -hmm. And I'd worked, I'd written it while my daughter was on her way. And um, so um, I was getting in deeper and deeper and enjoying <laughs> it more and more. And it wasn't 55 when we changed our name from Deans of Men and Department for Deans mm -hmm. of Women, which soon became Deans of Men, too, because the men deans who were in the college petitioned us to let them come into the courses. Mm -hmm. And the Sturdivant, Professor Sturdivant did. She was head of the department. Well, um, in 1932, just after I'd come back from the birth of my son, I said, since these men wanted to come in, why didn't we change the name? And instead of calling it a department for deans of women and girls, why didn't we call it Student Personnel Administration and Guidance. Mm -hmm. And Professor Sturdivant and the rest of the staff adopted the idea right away. So we changed our name. And um, it changed our program. It changed our staff, as you can imagine. And um, then I was asked to develop this guidance laboratory, which was lots of fun. See, how much time did I spend there? 36 to 62, something like mm -hmm. that. But I also kept my full job in the Department of Student Personnel and Guidance. And um, then Professor Sturdivant died in 40, and I was made head of the department. And um, I, I was just having a great time. I was in Washington a great deal, all over the country, really. But the department flourished. And people came from all over the country and other countries, mm -hmm. and that was fun. Take me back just for a moment to, to 1937 or the period just prior to that, mm -hmm. and how the committee of ACE actually pursued its task. I understand that you did some early drafting mm -hmm. of that specific document, and then it was adopted in the spring of 37, and then what happened to it after that? Well, <laughs> it was fairly early in the, th well, actually, I wrote an article. There was a man on the new committee that Ed Williamson chaired named Cowley, Hal H. W. H. Cowley. Mm -hmm. And we all called him Hal Cowley. He was, he had a magnificent brain. He just finished his doctor's degree at the University of Chicago. And he was an interesting guy. I had him come and teach for a semester in my department. And um, students were fascinated mm -hmm. with him and the kinds of ideas that he had and developed. And um, so I asked him whether I could write. He was the editor at that time of the Journal of Higher Education out of Ohio University. Mm -hmm. and. I did. He said, write it, go ahead. And I wrote a paper, which was published in 1934, on trying to distinguish the services and the coordination that those, there were so many services that had developed because students needed them, but they were all independent. So they needed coordination. And I described the administration, the kind of administration that they needed, with involvement, of course, by all of them, not a dictatorial mm -hmm. administration. 
And then Hal published it in 1934. And then I wrote him and said, that wasn't enough, that we needed a kind of a, another crowning speech, or not a paper, an that I wanted to write. Would he publish it? And that paper was to be on the values that personnel work could and should contribute to the full education of the students and the kind of campus that they should help to develop mm -hmm. in their situations and the values that they should stand for. And they should involve faculty and certainly students. And um, so Hal said it certainly did needed to be done. But he thought that the American Council on Education's committee was, should do it. And he was a good politician, and he persuaded them that um, we should, as a committee, we should get out that kind of a, of a brochure. And Hal and a man named Edward Lee, Edwin Lee, and I were appointed to write it. Mm -hmm. So you were a subcommittee of the, yes, the broader right. committee. And um, then we had an idea of getting out a whole series of brochures, as you know. Mm -hmm. And um, really, it was Hal Cowley and I who wrote that. So, um, so you and Hal were working very diligently on the oh, draft we were of the student just, personnel statement. And he was such a good thinker, and he wrote so well. Mm -hmm. And it was I just loved working with him. And we turned out that uh, brochure. And so that was drafted and then brought to the committee. And uh, did the committee do much with that document when Along they received it? Along with or? the other brochures. Okay. We got the idea of doing these other brochures. And I did another brochure all by myself, because I was on sabbatical and I didn't have anybody to work with me. In 1937, now our student personnel point of view brochure was ready. Oh, it didn't take us more than. 15 months to do it, meeting occasionally mm -hmm. in Washington. And so it could have been published, but they were all held. And in 1937, Dr. Adams, who was president of the American Council, got together the fragments that were left of people who had worked in the program that, of, the, of student personnel work for the American Council. It's ultimately the American Council that endorsed the statement, That's though there right. were really no they got other together. associations. Everybody that who was still living. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in 1937, there were 18 that were still alive, if you can believe it. You ref referred a little bit earlier to some of to the importance that you placed on identifying the values of student personnel work. Uh, I know that the student personnel point of view identifies some of those, but just in your own uh, words, what do you think are the, uh, the, the essential values that formed student personnel work? Well, you know, Denny, can we look at that chart? Each of us has a very inner, we live in a very inner circle. And psychology had emphasized this inner circle and the people who had been in that circle with us and contributed greatly, mm -hmm. very close to us in our early lives. And then some went out. Our parents have to step aside a little bit when we marry. Mm -hmm. And we bring somebody else into the inner circle. And some people nowadays must have people going, coming and going into that inner circle. And, um, but I think the luckiest people are the ones who can find individuals with whom they want to live all their lives in that inner circle. But just outside, any happy person has other beloveds and friends and acquaintances. And um, I think student personnel work did have that idea. And they set up some very good counseling. So one of the essential differences from the start was that student personnel did, in fact, look beyond just the individual person, but look into the human environment, the other people yes, around. Yes, yes, okay. it did. And, but not as much as it should have. I'd had the privilege of working with some of the great sociologists, France Boas, who 
I wasn't registered with with him in a class, but I was permitted to go and listen. And he was the founder, I guess, mm -hmm. of anthropology, a lot of anthropological theory. And he was the sponsor of um, Ruth Benedict and Margaret Mead. And I thought what they were doing was fascinating, studying these different societies. And um, there was a woman at Harvard, Dr. White, who with her husband was planning, she spent over, they spent over a year planning to study simultaneously the cultures in six different countries. And they had, it was a tremendous job to get people, a man and a woman, who could get along together, who would learn the language of the place where they were going to get acquainted with the people in their life. and learn something about the geography, all that. Well, anyway, they did a very interesting comparative study of cultures, and um, she was disappointed in it. It didn't come out the way she'd wanted. It was a very difficult thing to do. But I, with the influence of France Boas and a wonderful sociologist who was developing a theory and doing it right in the class with us partly, which was wonderful. <laughs> he was Ogburn, who went to Chicago and did a great big two-volume study with committee to help him of um, the development of civilization. Well, he, he was fascinating. And um, great big tall guy, he'd come in and all the only props he had was a straight back chair. And he would sit with his legs over one side and then the other and then over the back. I worried that he'd tip the chair over, but he didn't. <laughs> and he was thinking about this thing. And he drew us a picture of the way culture, by, uh, by, uh, by geometry, I mean, very difficult mathematics, had you got one new thing and it combined with other new things. And then they combined with other new things. He'd gone down and worked in the patent office. And he developed this double hyperbola to describe how civilization had developed. And I wondered when it was going to turn back on itself and fall over because it went, it curved so fast. Well, working with him, and I had some wonderful philosophers and religionists theologians over at Union Theological Seminary, some of the great thinkers of this age. And all of that history, it made me see a campus in a little different way, not as just a collection of individuals who needed to be counseled in the different ways that all of these uh, would be leaders in the field, or Freudians or whatever, had tried to get us to use. But I saw the work of student person, of personnel people, and as college campuses, needing somebody who really could look at the campus as a social. You see, these, this first circle, which was the individual in the center, intersected with other circles because everybody lived at the center of circles. And those circles intersected and you had all kinds of things going on. And I've been practicing trying to look at campuses that way. So we've got all these intersecting circles too. And you get a culture, which was Franz Boas had talked about and his students had explored. So in student personnel, at least two of the major values early on were the importance of the individual. That's right. And then also and never lost it. how the individual relates in the community and how that, individuals and communities are established together. That's what makes up the together. community. Right. What other essential values besides the importance of the individual and in the community, what other important values do you think were there from the, from the very start? Were there any? Others? Leadership. Leadership. Unquestionably. You had a wonderful opportunity in this intersecting thing to see who was emerging as leaders, what kind of people they were. Mm -hmm. And like you, you're mm -hmm. in charge of the leadership program. 
down there at SMU and uh, influencing, finding the leaders who stood for various things and working with those groups and trying to have the group see whom they wanted to have as the leader and sort of giving the leader a little bit more of a push mm -hmm. as, they, as you develop the programs. Mm -hmm. And those programs, the centers of significant living, the significant groups, identifying those on campus. Let's, let's go on to mm -hmm. uh, another very important yep. point that I see as being uh, a part of the student personnel point of view. And in the original 37 statement, yeah. uh, quite something is made of the importance of the student personnel staff not yeah. only being the ones responsible That's right. for this, but that it was a shared responsibility uh, with faculty, staff, That's everyone. Right. How and was it students. That, mm -hmm. I don't think we emphasize students enough. How was it that your original committee conceived of sharing that role? How was that supposed to happen? It has to permeate a faculty meeting and getting faculty into the dormitories. Mm -hmm. Harvard did that very interestingly mm -hmm. in lieu of lots of, of offices of counselors who had been trained mm -hmm. under Carl Rogers, actually. They tried that for a while. This is through tutors, basically, in the... No, the they, they were just counselors. Just counselors. And the okay. individuals who had problems were supposed to go to them in mm -hmm. these individual offices. And Harvard gave it a good try. Mm -hmm. One of the ways that it was conceived to involve faculty in the student personnel right point of view was to literally have them live in residence right. halls, advise student yes. organizations, uh, those kinds of things. And be models in a sense too. Okay. When they weren't on the lecture stand talking to the students, they um, were living with them. Mm -hmm. And they were, um, I remember I did a study at Colgate and um, the faculty dropped in to the residence halls, who, the ones who didn't live there, and the students had big bowl, brass bowls or copper bowls of apples and they'd sit there and talk with the students on their way home. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that kind of thing. I want to take I, a second. No, okay, I ahead. spent a few days at um, Oxford mm -hmm. and had the, they called them principals, of one of the women's college as my guide. She spent a lot of time <coughs> with me. She was a historian and she told me so much interesting history about Oxford. And um, she, um, asked me exactly what it was I did, and I tried to tell it to her. And she listened very intelligently, and she said, but it sounds to me as though you're doing deliberately what we just do. Naturally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Moving forward, historically speaking, the 1960s mm -hmm. is uh, seen as a period of time when perhaps a lot of the core values of student personnel or the, the purposes and actual organization of student personnel, uh, that we went through a lot of change. How did you view the 1960s and what were it some of the most significant things It was a very difficult age. Mm -hmm. It spread and it spread. It started maybe at um, Berkeley, probably did pretty much. And there was a lot of rebellious literature that you could get hold of if that was what you wanted to get into. It was a very difficult time. How did that affect how we uh, conducted ourselves as student personnel people on the college campus? We had an awful hard time mm -hmm. as student personnel people. Then. I, so many of my students wrote and said, you never taught us about this. Well, it hadn't existed. Sure. So the change was brought about by conflict, and the conflict really uh, forced student personnel people to look at students differently. Then. And I'm not sure that we couldn't trace that back to the, one of the first things that the NSA did, National Student Association. They did away, you remember, with in loco parentis, mm -hmm took all of the power away from the student personnel people to, if they needed a sudden operation for appendicitis and you couldn't get hold of the parents, the, it was legal for the student personnel people to authorize the doctors to go mm -hmm. ahead and do the best they could. 
Well, the NSA said, nuts to that, you can't do it anymore, and they got it done away with. Mm -hmm. And I think that changed the atmosphere from that moment on, the relationship between the students, which we've had to struggle to get back. Well, we've talked about the importance of the 60s in terms of causing us and student personnel to rethink what we were doing. Do you feel that since the 60s there has been, uh, have we mainly stayed with that uh, loss of in loco parentis and, and those changes, or have you seen other changes that have occurred that have been significant since 1960s? You know, my impression is that students in the 80s don't care so much mm -hmm. about anything in the college and university. Now this is maybe most of them. Accepting going to class, getting what they came for in class, um, getting ahead, mm -hmm. thinking about making money, they're, they recognize that their future is very close, much more than the 18-year-olds mm -hmm. ever did. And uh, they don't care so much about what's going on in college. And I think we must get that back as a part of our educational program, which certainly means working with faculty and working with the students mm -hmm. themselves, the leaders. <coughs> because just going to class isn't enough if you have an opportunity like Oxford has to do more than that for the mm. person to to turn them out a more effective productive finer more caring kind of person how do we as student personnel people provide those without being intrusive in a student's life how do we stimulate them to be the interested in the kinds of things? Groups and the student discussion group. of the students. Okay. And I don't think that we should or can tell them what to think. Mm -hmm. I think we've got to, there's a lot of content, of course, they have to learn in the sciences, well, everything, I mean, that they have to learn, that's, and that's right. Um, but they've got to have this other part to, mm -hmm. in my view, to turn out the kind of, of human beings that we want Americans to be known as being. Mm -hmm. Faculty and personnel people have to work with those groups. And uh, um, we don't know enough about how to do it yet. And that is what I hope the next phase of student personnel work will, will focus on. Because I think education is terribly important. It's terribly important that people learn how to make a living, but it's terribly important that they learn how to live with each other in communities, groups, families. Even though some students that are in the contemporary college don't necessarily uh, see the importance of community and leadership, all you have to do is give them one experience. Mm -hmm. And it really does enliven them and mm -hmm. fires them up to want to be involved mm -hmm. in that kind of thing because they feel how positive that is mm -hmm. and how that makes more meaning in their mm -hmm. own lives. Uh, I think that uh, perhaps some of the trends that you've identified are relatively easy to turn around if we will just take mm -hmm. the initiative to mm -hmm. try and engage students in that it, way. It certainly takes that kind of leadership mm -hmm. and initiative, as you said. What are some of the other issues that you think are critical in the 1980s uh, and beyond even? What do you think are the things that we need to really pay attention to? We could get into the whole family business. Mm -hmm. and um, Preparing for a new yeah, type of family. The mothers mm -hmm. working, and I know what that is, and loved it because we, we worked out conditions for the children, so mm -hmm. it was good for them. They turned out all right. Mm -hmm. and, but it's, we don't have enough really good provisions for the youngsters while the mother and father are both working. And I would like to see more 
family meals together. I think mm -hmm. so much can happen around a dining table. I'd like to shift for a few minutes to Esther Lloyd-Jones, the leader and the person, and just ask a few questions about that uh, and just really have you reflect personally. Uh, one of the things of curiosity uh, would be what are the things that have really given you the greatest satisfaction in your professional career? What have been the really high points? In my professional career? Professional and personal. Well, in my professional career, it's been the wonderful people with whom I've had a chance to work. Mm -hmm. I don't know quite how it was that we attracted so many excellent, marvelous people who have taken leadership you never came and studied with us. But other people, wonderful, fine people, who have, oh, I could take any number of cases of people who have done wonderful things for their communities, been on national committees and done fine things. For instance, um, one of our women students who was dean of women and a very effective dean of women at Purdue and she was selected as the head of one of the women's units when the Congress established the WACs, mm -hmm. women in the federal, in the uh, military service. And um, she headed up that. When she got through with that, she was the head of the Campfire Girls. Mm -hmm. And then she did that for a few years and then she was made the first chairman of the committee, national committee, that had the job of figuring out how life could be made easier for the handicapped. Mm -hmm. Final question, Esther. I hope you don't mind me saying, but I know you were born in 1901. Yes. And you went right through school, completed bachelor's, master's, doctorate, had children, maintained a full-time career, were professionally involved. You were president of the American College Personnel Association, 35 to 37, and you have been a prolific author, speaker. How do you manage to maintain that kind of energy to this very day? Because I know you read uh, a lot every day, correspond, you're doing your own writing. What is it that helps you maintain that kind of energy? I was my mother's smallest child. She had very big children, 10, 11 pounders. Mm -hmm. My doctor said they were sugar tongue babies, you know, put them in a diaper, <laughs> give it a jerk, and that's what they weighed. But I was, I was average, I guess, just about. Mother said I didn't cry when I was born. I cooed. Mm -hmm. And I've been very fortunate. I've begun to see that I've had sections of my life that are almost separate. And each one has had its joys, its satisfactions. I've loved it, excepting everyone has had sorrows. And I did have, after my father died, and I adored him, um, I kind of went downhill for a while. And uh, my mother, said that I just, I was two years ahead anyway, so she said I should just go to school half a day. And I heard a doctor tell her that I was anemic and that I probably should be eating a couple of raw eggs a day. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought if two is good, a dozen is better. <laughs> <laughs> this was after my father died, so I must have been about 12. Uh -huh. And I was in high school. and. I stood at the kitchen sink with a bottle of grape juice and a little cup, and I would break an egg in there, put some grape juice on it, and swallow it. I stood at the sink because I wasn't sure I was going to get them all down. I took a dozen eggs a day <laughs> until, for quite a little while, until the doctor heard about it. He said, oh, no, she mustn't. Mm -hmm. Well, my mother didn't know either, I guess, excepting her eggs must have vanished pretty fast. And um, they thought I was going to have bro chronic bronchitis. And so that was when I was staying out of high school, half a day. 
and she sent me down to a Swedish massage place where I was in with a lot of older ladies and I sat in a steam room mm -hmm. with these older ladies, fat most of them, and um, till I was good and hot. And then I had a wonderful Swedish woman who took a stiff brush. And, oh, it was. And then they put me into and salt, a stiff brush and salt. And I, it was fun. And then she put me, wrapped me up in a sheet and made me lie in a bed mm -hmm. and told me to go to sleep, which I didn't always do, but until I was cooled off. And that did a lot, you know, that steam mm -hmm. from. So I got over my bronchitis. I wasn't going to have bron chronic bronchitis. And from then on, I don't recommend a dozen eggs a day, but that year I grew six inches, I gained 20 pounds, Good grief. and I have been pretty Health vigorous system. ever since. And the 40 years I was at TC, I never missed a day for illness. That's wonderful. Didn't think about it much at the time. I had flu, but I always had it on vacations. Mm -hmm. And my daughter, who became a psychiatrist, said that, that I was neurotic, or I couldn't do that. <laughs> In closing, I would like to suggest that the reason that you have so much energy, one of the things that we're finding now is that leaders who have great passions in life, who are really committed and have a mission to fulfill, they're the ones that maintain the energy and uh, do the kinds of things that you've done.